Pickett's Charge Explained, created by Moments in History. It is July 3rd, 1863, day three of the Battle of Gettysburg. The Union Army is south of the town of Gettysburg in a very strong defensive position. From Culp's Hill, wrapping around Cemetery Hill, and extending down along Cemetery Ridge to both of the round tops. Except for some minor Confederate gains, the Union Army has successfully repelled the Confederate Army's attacks up to this point. Lee develops a plan to have nine brigades of men all attack one single location at the center of the Union line. Lee feels that, despite their strong position, the Union line will not have enough men in that area to defend against an assault that large. Ever since research from the 1880s, it has been believed that the focal point or target area of the Confederate infantry attack was an area now called the Cops of Trees. However, some historians have begun to argue that the target area was actually Ziegler's Grove. Because A.P. Hill is ill, General Lee places General Longstreet both in charge of the attack as well as selecting which brigades will participate. Longstreet selects all three brigades from George Pickett's division all four brigades from Johnston Pettigrew's division. Pettigrew was promoted to division commander after Henry Heath was wounded on the first day of battle. And two brigades from Major General Isaac Trimble's division. Trimble was promoted to division commander after Dorsey Pender was mortally wounded on the second day of battle. For a total of nine brigades on the assault, about 12,000 to 13,000 men total. Back at the Confederate position on Seminary Ridge, General Lee rides out to check on General Longstreet's preparations. Longstreet does not have confidence in the success of this attack and expresses this to Lee. General, I have been a soldier all my life. I have been with soldiers engaged in fights by couples, by squads, companies, regiments, divisions, and armies and should know as well as anyone what soldiers can do. It is my opinion that no 15,000 men ever arrayed for battle can take that position. Lee is not swayed. Pointing towards Cemetery Ridge, he replies back, The enemy is there, and I am going to strike him! The Confederates begin their artillery attack, trying to destroy the Union artillery and weaken the defending infantry. The Union artillery counterattacks. The number of cannons used by both sides vary from source to source, with some sources counting cannons that were there but not used. However, the total number of cannons for both sides combined was somewhere between 250 to well over 300, making this one of, or possibly, the largest artillery battle ever on North American soil. The cannon fire for the Union side is commanded by Chief of Artillery, Brigadier General Henry Hunt. The cannon fire from the Confederates is commanded by one of Longstreet's artillery commanders, Colonel Porter Alexander. Alexander does not have enough ammunition to effectively soften up the Union forces like Lee desires. Furthermore, on many shell shots, the eternal fuses in the shell are inefficient, burn too slow, and take too long to ignite the shell, causing many shots to be past the Union troops when they get Because the smoke from the cannon fire obstructs the view, Alexander and the Confederates cannot tell that they are overfiring the Union troops with the shells. During the artillery battle, Hunt begins to silence the Union guns to conserve ammunition for the upcoming infantry assault. Hunt orders that the cannons stop firing one by one, slowly over time, so that the Confederates will be fooled into thinking that they were knocking those cannons out of commission with their fire. The plan works. Alexander and the Confederates are fooled into thinking that many Union cannons are destroyed, that actually are still fully operational. Most sources claim that the artillery battle lasts about an hour, but a few sources claim up to two hours. As the Union guns are silenced, Alexander sends a message to Longstreet for the infantry assault to start, writing, Come quick or my ammunition will not let me support you properly. General Pickett then asks General Longstreet if he should step off and begin the attack. Longstreet, who still does not think the attack will be successful, can only nod his reply. To fully appreciate Pickett's charge, one must understand the situation that the charging troops are facing. For the Confederates to reach the Union line, the advancing infantry must cross over an open area about three quarters of a mile long, some historians claim a little longer or shorter than that, fully exposed to Union fire. The way a charge like this is performed, 
is that the troops walk in formation toward the enemy line and then break into a run when they are within a couple of hundred yards of the enemy. While advancing in the open area, the Confederates must cross the Emmitsburg Road, which has a rail fence on its west side and a post and board fence on the east, that the Confederates must climb over or break down on their advance. During a charge like this, the defending army will fire cannons at the advancing infantry, first with shot and shell, and then when the enemy is within about 400 yards, grape and canister shot, which are cans or bags holding smaller balls, basically turning a cannon into a large shotgun. The Confederate artillery assault has failed to take out much of Hunt's Union artillery on Cemetery Ridge. In addition, the Union also has available and uses artillery positioned north of Little Round Top and on Cemetery Hill. Once past the open area, the Confederates will be advancing toward Union infantry positioned behind a stone wall for protection that they can fire over. While, as previously mentioned, there is debate on where the exact intended target is for the advance, the area where the Confederates advanced the farthest is a corner turn in the fence line now known as the angle. The infantry charge begins. Leading the way on the Confederate left side is Brigadier General James Johnston Pettigrew's division of four brigades. Behind him are the two brigades from Major General Isaac Trimble's division. The right flank of the charge is Major General George Pickett's division of three brigades. Henry Hunt begins his artillery assault against the infantry, hitting the middle of the Confederate advance, along with the artillery from Cemetery Hill hitting the Confederate left side, and Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery's artillery, just north of Little Round Top, hitting the Confederate right. The Union artillery rains fire down upon the Confederates as they advance in formation. The artillery shot and shell, pouring down on the Confederates, is wrecking havoc on the advancing line, creating gaps in the middle. The width of the Confederate line begins to shrink down in size as troops shift toward the center to fill in the gaps. As the Confederates advance closer to the Union line, they begin to approach the fences on the Emmitsburg Road. Crossing the Emmitsburg Road and fences slows down the advancing troops, creating a bottleneck. Pickett's three brigades cross the Emmitsburg Road and perform an oblique left turn that now has them marching at a 45 degree angle, closing the gap between them and Pettigrew's and Trimble's men. Pettigrew's division begins to arrive at the fences on the Emmitsburg Road. The Union 8th Ohio Regiment stands up from a hidden flanking position on the Confederate left side of the advance, firing all at once in a volley. Some of Pettigrew's men retreat here. The Union artillery switches from shot and shell to canister fire. The Confederates are now within musket firing distance. 2nd Corps, 3rd Division Commander Alexander Hayes has his division stacked three and four men deep behind a stone wall for protection. Hayes has his troops fire over the wall and then step back to reload, with men trading places with each other to load and to shoot. Hayes rides back and forth on horseback behind his men, encouraging them. Hurrah! The left side of the advancing Confederates are now being hit with shot and shell from the longer range artillery. Canister fire from closer artillery. Rapid musket fire from Hayes men quickly changing places with each other behind the stone wall. And fire from the previously concealed 8th Ohio Regiment. Most of Pettigrew's advance stalls and retreats at or just beyond the Emmitsburg Road fences. However, many troops do keep advancing and attempt to charge the wall just south of Ziegler's Grove. As they approach the stone wall, they are repulsed by Hayes men. The left side of the charge ends here. As Pickett's three brigades march, their right flank is now exposed to the troops on Cemetery Ridge. Pickett's men are taking many casualties, first from Stannard's brigade from the 1st Corps, and then from two of Gibbon's brigades from Hancock's 2nd Corps. After the Confederates pass by them, Standard has his brigade march forward and turn right to face north, firing into the rear of Pickett's men. Moving toward the angle, Pickett's men are now taking fire from Standard's brigade behind them and give his division on Cemetery Ridge to their side. Around this time, 2nd Corps Commander Winfield Hancock receives a serious wound in his thigh. Hancock refuses to be evacuated to the rear during the fighting. Pickett's three brigades finish closing the gap between them and the other advancing Confederates. 
all Confederates still advancing start to charge toward the Union troops behind the stone wall. As the Confederates begin to approach the angle, two Union regiments retreat, creating two places in the Union line which are very undermanned. Confederate Brigadier General James Kemper shouts, There are the guns, boys! Go for them! In one area, Captain Andrew Cohen orders that five cannons fire a double shot of canister all at the same time. This greatly reduces the Confederate forces attacking the spot. Union reinforcements arrive now. The other spot where the Union regiment retreats is still exposed. Brigadier General Louis Armistead places his hat on his sword and shouts, Come on, boys! We must give them the cold steel! Who will follow me? Armistead, along with 100 to 200 Confederate troops, storm over the stone wall. Confederate and Union troops engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Armistead is mortally wounded and captured. Four Union reinforcements arrive, and the remaining Confederates that breach the stone wall are either killed or captured. The rest of the Confederate charge is repulsed at the stone wall. The advance stalls, and the remaining troops fall back to seminary. The entire infantry assault is over in less than an hour. And stay off my lawn!